Vertical launch systems, or VLS, are arguably the best thing that have happened to naval weapon systems since the 1980s. But they have one massive shortcoming. They are extremely tricky to reload. And despite many attempts at addressing this problem, it still remains the single weakest link in the logistics of rearming these systems. But why the US Navy eliminated the built-in cranes that once used to arm the VLS on the ships? What truly limits the maximum firing rate of vertical launch systems? And why the US Navy switched from armed launchers to VLS cells in the first place, even though armed launchers had one undeniable advantage? It's not what you think. In October 2023, the destroyer USS Kearney was in the northern Red Sea when it was forced to fire multiple interceptors. This was done in order to neutralize the four cruise missiles and 15 airborne drones which were launched by Houthi rebels from Yemen and were headed straight for Israel in the aftermath of the October 7, 2023 conflict between Israel and Palestine. To intercept those 19 targets, at least 19 SM-2 missiles would have been fired in one day. That's 19 out of the total of 90 VLS cells on this destroyer. This one instance demonstrates how a potential swarm attack can cause a warship to go Winchester, meaning it would deplete all its armament of missiles, making the ship useless. Once a ship goes Winchester, it needs to be reloaded, and that is where the problem begins. Rearming a vertical launch system is simple but not easy. A canister which houses one or more missiles needs to be lowered into the cell. That's the simple part. But to rearm the ship while it's underway requires a powerful crane in the middle of a calm ocean. And that's the not so easy part. It's like threading a needle, but the thread is full of explosives and both the thread and the needle are rolling with the waves. That said, it's not impossible to do. So first, let's take a look at the crane. These cranes were installed on some of the first ships that received the Mark 41 vertical launch systems, starting with USS Bunker Hill, a Ticonderoga class guided missile cruiser, and later on aboard Arleigh Burke class destroyers. These cranes came built in with the VLS module. See, the basic building block of VLS is an 8 cell Mark 41 module, where each cell holds one canister that could house anything from evolved Sea Sparrow missiles to larger Tomahawk missiles. These canisters are sealed, which provides protection from the elements, say corrosion, and preserves the integrity of the components inside. The seal is only broken as the missile is being launched out of the canister. Each ship would typically have multiple of these building blocks. On the earlier ships, one of the blocks would only have five cells instead of eight, sacrificing three cells for a collapsible crane to assist with rearming. But it soon turned out that these cranes could only lift medium-range missiles like the SM-2. They were incapable of lifting larger loads like the SM-6 and Tomahawk cruise missiles. That's why the US Navy stopped using these cranes, to the extent that Flight 2A Arleigh destroyers and later iterations eliminated the cranes altogether to make room for additional VLS cells. For example, USS Spruance, which is a Flight 2A Arleigh Burke destroyer, has 32 VLS cells forward, another 64 cells aft of the ship, and no cranes. But why did the Navy remove the cranes, instead of just making them more powerful so they could lift heavier missiles? The thing is, the bigger issue was the sea state conditions in the ocean. The original requirements called for replenishing 20 VLS canisters per hour in C-State 5 conditions. But in practice, the cranes could only transfer 3 canisters per hour, and even that was limited to C-State 3 conditions. It turns out you can't calm down the ocean whenever you want to rearm your VLS cells. So currently, a ship is forced to sail to a select port to reload its VLS cells. This approach is not just some minor inconvenience for the ship. It in fact represents a significant operational liability, especially in high-intensity combat scenarios against peer adversaries. So what is the solution? In June 2017, Admiral John Richardson, who was the Chief of Naval Operations at the time, said that the US Navy is bringing back VLS underway replenishment. 
but it's unlikely that the VLS replenishments will be done the same way that supplies are replenished underway. Unrep is when a logistics vessel steams alongside a combatant at 12 to 15 knots and transfers supplies and fuel over a high wire that's connected between the two. And even though that does work for supplies, it would not work for VLS. The sea state is still a limiting factor. You also have to keep in mind that during unrep, both ships are quite vulnerable since they're connected to each other with cables and are moving fairly slowly and in a straight line. In case of an emergency, the two ships need to be able to break away fairly quickly, even though it's not ideal for the fuel transfer rig. Now imagine a canister with a Tomahawk missile inside as it's being loaded into a VLS cell. A quick and safe breakaway of the two ships during unrep would be pretty much impossible. The first step in making VLS reloading more expeditionary is to stage all the cranes, equipment and personnel on a logistics ship instead of a pier. This would allow for forward reloading. That's where the combatant and the logistics ships meet in a protected harbor somewhere close to the contested area. Both ships then anchor or just hold their positions with the help of some bumpers. Then a forklift brings over a VLS canister to the deck and places it on a rotating hinge. The logistics ship is equipped with a powerful crane, which is hooked up to one end of the canister. The crane then slowly lifts up the canister, which pivots upward with the help of the hinge. Once completely vertical, the safety pins are removed which allow the canister to be lifted off the logistics ship and moved over to the combatant ship's VLS module. On the receiving end, personnel steer the canister with the help of ropes and by hand and carefully guide it into the opening of the VLS cell. The canister is finally lowered into the cell until it's securely in place. A similar but inverse process is followed to remove the empty canisters from the VLS cells and transfer them onto the logistics ship. The biggest benefit of this approach is that rearming the VLS is no longer limited to certain ports that have the proper facilities. The logistics and combatant ships could meet up anywhere that has calm enough waters. It could be near some island or atoll, which are protected from winds and currents. This could save weeks of transit time and enable the combatant ship to get back to the front lines faster. But with the obvious limitations of VLS reloading at sea, why did the US Navy switch over from arm launchers, which could be rearmed at sea in the first place? Prior to vertical launch systems, Mark 26 twin arm launchers were commonly used on US Navy destroyers and cruisers. These launchers were fed from behind by a magazine below the main deck. Vertical launch systems revolutionized the ship's weapon system, since not only could they hold more missiles, they could also have a greater variety of weapons. For example, each VLS canister can house one large-diameter missile, such as a Tomahawk cruise missile to strike land targets, rocket-assisted anti-submarine torpedoes, SM-2 missiles for short-range air defense, SM-6 for long-range air defense, and SM-3 to intercept ballistic missiles outside the atmosphere. Alternatively, one canister could house four small-diameter evolved Sea Sparrow missiles, which are used for local air defense. Of course, each ship is armed with a different combination of these missiles based on its mission. The nice thing about VLS is that all missiles are ready to fire at any given time, since nothing needs to be loaded into a magazine. We should also clear up some misconceptions about the firing rate of vertical launch systems. I don't think it's unreasonable at all to assume that VLS could easily launch one missile from each cell every second, and if you alternate between the VLS stations in the aft and forward, that means two missiles per second could be launched. But what really limits the firing rate has nothing to do with the VLS module itself. Take an SM-2 rocket, for example, which has semi-active radar homing. This means the rocket will need external radar illumination for terminal guidance. That guidance is done with the help of SPG-62 fire control radars, which point toward the target and shoot a narrow beam that reflects off the target. The reflection is then used by the SM-2's passive receiver to home in on the target. 
Arleigh Barracks have three SPG-62 fire control radars, and each radar has four guidance channels. This means that the Aegis combat system can only control 12 SM-2 missiles simultaneously during their terminal phase. Although, because the target illumination is only needed for the last few seconds prior to interception, a ship can have more SM-2 missiles in the air than just 12. But the human element of the system is yet another limiting factor. Even though the Aegis combat system can identify and track over a hundred targets at any given time, the team of weapons specialists in the command center could manage only so many weapons and targets at any given time. And this is important, considering tragic accidents like the downing of Iran Air Flight 655 on July 3, 1988. Even though the Aegis system on USS Vincent had indicated that the target was ascending due to human error, the airplane was assumed to be descending in attack mode toward the ship. Operators fired two SM-2 rockets at the airliner. All 290 passengers and crew on board were killed. In practice, the firing rate of a vertical launch system is limited by the number of targets that can be effectively managed simultaneously. In addition to greater firepower, VLS is also much more damage tolerant. You could quite possibly disable an arm launcher with small arms or an RPG from a patrol boat, but the VLS is completely hidden under the deck. Well, except for variants that are installed on the deck. Since it has very few moving parts, VLS is more reliable compared to the arm launchers, which use more complicated hydraulic systems above and below the deck. Another thing is that arm launchers have a limited firing arc because the ship's superstructure is in the way. That means the ship may have to turn toward the target before the arm launcher can fire. Vertical launch systems, on the other hand, can shoot in all directions equally well. But there is one undeniable advantage that arm launchers have over VLS. Since arm launchers are angled outward, in case a rocket engine fails, the missile would most likely clear the deck and just fall in the water. But with VLS, since the rocket is shot up straight, if something goes wrong, it could fall right back on the deck, or even worse, like it did on June 21st, 2018. During a drill, the German frigate Zaxxon fired an SM-2 missile from its Mark 41 vertical launch system. But the rocket booster burnt out while the missile was still inside its canister, causing an explosion that injured two sailors. But there's a way to reduce this risk. There are three types of VLS launch. What we've shown you so far was all examples of hot launch. In a hot launch, the missile propels itself out of the canister using its own engine. That's why this vent opens up before the missile has even left the cell so the hot exhaust can leave the system without damaging the VLS cell. In contrast, some vertical launch systems are designed for cold launch, where a mechanism inside the cell ejects the missile, and only once the missile is in the air, its rocket engine fires. The system is safer, since no explosions would happen inside the VLS cell in case the rocket engine malfunctions. Russian vertical launch systems are often designed with a slant so that a malfunctioning missile would land in the water and not on the ship. Some Chinese naval ships like the Type 52 destroyer use a concentric canister launch system which can do both hot and cold launches. As you can see, during hot launch, the exhaust leaves from the same cell that the rocket is launched from and not from a separate vent. Speaking of China, the issue of rearming VLS-equipped ships are probably no more salient than in the Western Pacific, where the US now finds itself facing down a peer competitor for the first time since the Cold War. China has the advantage of having its entire military strength in its backyard, as opposed to the US, which can only allocate a portion of its globally dispersed force to East Asia, which is far from home. If China launched a swarm of anti-ship missiles at the US Navy fleet in the area, even if all of them are intercepted, it could easily deplete the defensive missile arsenal on those ships. And once the ships go Winchester, they may have to go to Guam or Japan to rearm. Or maybe they'll just find a little island nearby. <laughs>